Good evening and welcome to another Daniel and the Revelation reading. I'm your host, Salvador Gomez. Let us begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, as we bow before you, Lord, we thank you for another day. Thank you for your love and mercy. As always, you are faithful. You are kind and loving. And uh, you have seen us through this day until now that we might come together at this time to read through this book. Uh, that we might have the opportunity to hear your voice. And we ask, dear Father, that you would please be with this reading, be with each and every one of us in a spe special way. Be with anyone that is going through any problems. I know that I have my own uh, trials and my own afflictions that I must go through, and I just pray that you would be with me as well. And Lord, uh, you have always been faithful in seeing me through and I'm very thankful for that dear father and I pray that each and every one of us can have that experience as well we ask that you would give us more faith uh, a childlike faith ever believing in what you have promised help us to seek for your promises father and to remember them to treasure them because uh, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that cometh out of your mouth. And so, Father, we ask that you would feed us of your words. Help us to live by them. Help us to understand them. And be with me as I read through this, um, this portion of our reading. And I ask for your Holy Spirit Father that you would give me a clear understanding of the things that you have declared for us please be with each and every one that is joining with each and every one that will uh, come across this video please be with them their father and help them as well and so we thank you for your wonderful blessings, for everything, Father, for your dear Son that you allowed to come to this earth to, to die for us, that we might have the opportunity to be with you. Thank you, dear Father. And these things we do ask in the precious name of your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Very well, let us begin and pick up where we left off. We are in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, and we will be reading from verses 12 through 17. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he, which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth, but I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, 
let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and I and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Against the church of Smyrna, which has just been considered, there was no word of condemnation uttered. Persecution is ever calculated to keep the church pure and incite its members to piety and godliness. But we now reach a period when influences began to work through which errors and evils were likely to creep in to the church. The word Pergamos signifies height, elevation. The period covered by this church may be located from the days of Constantine, or perhaps rather from his professed conversion to Christianity, A.D. 323, to the establishment of the papacy, A.D. 538. It was a period in which the true servants of God had to struggle against a spirit of worldly policy, pride, and popularity. Among the professed followers of Christ and against the virulent workings of the mystery of iniquity, which finally resulted in the full development of the papal man of sin where Satan's seat is. Christ takes cognizance of the unfavorable situation of his people during this period. The language is not probably designed to denote locality as to place. Satan works wherever Christians dwell. But surely there are times and seasons when he works with special power and the period covered by the Church of Pergamos was one of these. During this period, the doctrine of Christ was being corrupted, the mystery of iniquity was working, and Satan was lying, laying the very foundation of the most stupendous system of wickedness, the papacy. Here was the falling away foretold by Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 3. And so now we're going to read, or what we're reading rather, uh, deals with doctrines, false doctrines that crept into the church, into the Christian church um, uh, during the falling away period that was mentioned in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's keep reading. Antipas, that a class of persons is referred to by this name and not an individual. There is good reason to believe, for no authentic information respecting such an individual is now to be found. On this point, William Miller says, It is supposed that Antipas was not an individual, but a class of men who oppose the power of the bishops or popes in that day, being a combination of two words, anti, opposed, and papas, father or pope. And at that time, many of them suffered martyrdom in Constantinople and Rome where the bishops and popes began to exercise the power which soon after brought into subjection the kings of the earth and trampled on the rights of the Church of Christ. And for myself, I see no reason to reject this explanation of this word Antipas. In this text, 
as the history of those times is perfectly silent respecting such an individual as is here named. Watson says, Ancient ecclesiastical history furnishes no account of this Antipas. Dr. Clark mentions a work as extant called The Acts of Antipas, but gives us to understand that it is entitled to no credit. The Case of Censor Disadvantages in situation are no excuse for wrongs in the church. Although this church lived at a time when Satan was especially at work, it was their duty to keep themselves pure from the leaven of his evil doctrines. Hence, there were censored for harboring among them those who held the doctrines of Balaam and the Nicolaitans. See remarks on Nicolaitans verse 6. What the doctrine of Balaam was is here partially revealed. He taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. See a full account of this of his work and its results in Numbers chapter chapters 22 through 25 and 31 chapter 31 verses 13 through 16. It appears that Balaam desired to curse Israel for the sake of the rich reward which Balak offered him for doing, for so doing. But not being permitted by the Lord to curse them, he resolved to accomplish essentially the same thing, though in a different way. He therefore counseled Balak to seduce them by means of the females of Moab to participate in the celebration of the rites of idolatry and all its licentious accompany accompaniments. The plan succeeded. The abominations of idolatry spread through the camp of Israel. The curse of God was called down upon them by their sins, and there fell by the plague 24,000 persons. The doctrines complained of, of in the church of Pergamos were of course similar in their tendency, leading to spiritual idolatry, and in unlawful connection between the church and the world. Out of this spirit was finally produced the union of the civil and ecclesiastical powers which culminated in the formation of the papacy. And of course, uh, we can just look back into uh, history, into the time when the uh, pagan, uh, the pagan emperor Constantine uh, claimed that he was now going to be uh, a Christian emperor. Uh, with him, he brought all of his uh, pagan forms and practices and customs right into the Christian church. And so this was not a true um, uh, Christian belief, but it was actually a mixture of paganism with a very thin veneer of Christian garb. And so whatever his beliefs were before he claimed to be Christian, uh, remained. The only thing that changed was uh, the God that he claimed to worship was no longer Baal, but it was actually now uh, the God of the Bible and the Son of God as well. And so, and when it came to how they understood according to 
the uh, Nicene Creed. Uh, you can find that um, they believed that the Holy Spirit was actually a separate individual. This is where the Trinity comes from. And this is exactly what this uh, stumbling block is dealing with here in uh, the idol worship that was brought forward. Now, did they actually have literal idols? Of course they did. Yes. But they also believed, like that um, uh, which came from paganism itself, was the belief in a trinity, a triune God, um, three separate individuals that form one God. This is what they actually believed. And this is what um, doctrine God hates, according to what we just read. This is exactly what um, is being mentioned here in in the council to the church of Pergamos, uh, they are being told that this doctrine crept in to, uh, into the church. It's a stumbling block, which means that it's something that they, they would stumble over because they wouldn't see it. They wouldn't un really uh, understand it unless they... Uh, took heed to the word of God and so the idol worship was very prevalent at that time they actually did have literal uh, literal uh, idols that they were worshiping um, in the time of Constantine when he claimed to be converted to to Christianity but um, with him uh, he also brought his old customs his old beliefs his old traditions were also made part of what he understood uh, as Christianity and so this is the same struggle that is taking place within the Seventh-day Adventist Church as well as we have been going back into our pioneer writings and uh, we've been able to secure many many of our uh, foundational teachings after the passing of the time in 1844 there was a time when our pioneers came together to study the sanctuary and uh, the Sabbath in those studies they found out um, or they agreed rather that um, the Bible did not teach a trinity it did not teach that there's three gods um, or that there's three individuals that make one God or any anything like that um, they taught that the Father is uh, is God and the Father has a son and these are not role plays um, the Father uh, being first in time and uh, doesn't have a, be a beginning Jesus the Son of God um, even before he became man uh, was begun or born procreated at some point in time which we cannot calculate because um, this was actually before creation and so uh, Colossians chapter 2 verse 15 lets us know that Christ is um, from the beginning the firstborn of creation and so we can take those words very literally there's no there's no reason for us to understand that to be figurative at all Christ was at some point in time born um, begotten that's what that word means 
notice I didn't say created. Uh, the Bible doesn't teach that Christ was created because he is the creator. But he was born before anything was created. He was brought forth. Um, for more information on that, you can read uh, Proverbs chapter 8, where many are confused because it begins the chapter speaking about uh, wisdom and then as you continue reading about verses 20 and onward I believe it starts to mention um, Christ as being the one that was brought up with him uh, being brought forth before anything was created um, and Many people don't know how to distinguish that from being Christ or is that talking about wisdom? Well, the Bible says that Christ is the power of God and he is the wisdom of God. And yes, Christ is the express image of the Father. Um, and so he is equal to God and that he has received everything from God because he came forth from God and so if you want any more information on that we just recently did a video it's on YouTube uh, on a series called let the dead speak and that re relates to um, the teachings of our pioneers uh, according to Revelation chapter uh, 14 verse 13 uh, there would be a time when those that proclaim the third angel's message would um, at some point in time have to rest but their works would follow in other words their publications would continue to go forward and to be proclaimed here at the end of time and so we can uh, post that link if if anyone is interested in watching it um, or you can just go to uh, our YouTube channel Plain Upon Tables um, and just look for the video is fairly recent um, let the dead speak and so okay let's continue on to the next part repent by disciplining or expelling those who would hold these pernicious doctrines speaking of the Trinity and other uh, pagan uh, beliefs Christ declared that if they did not do this he would take the matter into his own hands and come unto them in judgment and fight against them. Those who held these evil doctrines and the whole church would be held responsible for the wrongs of those heretical ones whom the, they harbored in their midst. The promise to the overcomer, it is promised that he shall eat of the hidden manna and receive from his approving Lord a white stone with a new, new and precious name engraved thereon. Concerning manna that is hidden and a new name that no one is to know but he that receives it, not, not much in the way of exposition should be required. But there has been much conjecture upon these points and an allusion to them may be expected most commentators apply the manna white stone and new name to spiritual blessings to be enjoyed in this life but like all the other promises to the overcomer this one doubtless refers wholly to the future and is to be given when the time comes that the saints are to be rewarded. Perhaps the following from the late H. Blunt is a satisfactory 
as anything that has ever been written upon these several particulars. It is, it, it is generally thought by commentators that this refers to an ancient judicial custom of dropping a black stone into an urn when it is intended to condemn, and a white stone when the prisoner is to be acquitted. But this is an act so distinct from that described. I will give thee a white stone that we are disposed to agree with those who think it refers rather to a custom of a very different kind and not unknown to the classical reader according with beautiful propriety to the case of case before us in primitive times when traveling was rendered different from want of places of public entertainment hospitality was exercised by private in individuals to a very great extent of which indeed we find frequent traces in all history and in none more than the old testament persons who partook of this hospitality and those who practiced it frequently contracted habits of friendship and regard for each other and it became a well-established custom among the greeks and romans to provide their guests with some particular mark with which was handed down from father to son and ensured hospitality and kind treatment whenever it was presented this mark was usually a, a small stone or pebble cut in half upon the halves of each the host and the guests mutually inscribed their names and then interchanged with each other the production of this tessera was quite sufficient to ensure friendship for themselves or descendants whenever they traveled again in the same direction while it is evident that these stones required to be privately kept and the names written upon them carefully concealed lest others should obtain the privileges instead of the persons for whom they were intended how natural then the allusion to this custom in the words of the text i will give him to eat of the hidden manna and having done this having made him partake of my hospitality having recognized him as my guest and friend i will present him with a white stone and in the stone a new name written which no man knoweth save he who receiveth it I will give him a pledge of my friendship, sacred and inviolable, known only to himself. On the new name, Wesley very appropriately says, Jacob, after his victory, gained a, a new name of, gained the new name of Israel. Wouldst thou know what they knew? Wouldst thou know what the new name will be? the way to this is plain overcome till then all thy inquiries are vain thou wilt then read it on the white stone and we shall pause right there we have just finished reading the message of christ to the church of pergamos which referred to that time of the falling away, but it is also applicable to our time because history repeats. When we forget about history, when we forget about the, thing, the things that took place in the past, many of the times these things are repeated. And so let us not forget these things are also a witness for us that we we should also take heed to the things that were said to the church of that time um, and so with that said let us go ahead and end with a word of prayer father in heaven 
we just want to thank you so much for this opportunity once again to bow down before you. Thank you for your love and mercy and kindness. Thank you for teaching us and sharing these things with us, for making these things very plain to us, dear Father. Help us to be more fervent. Help us to be consecrated to your cause and to the work that you have called us to do, which is basically to allow you to take control of our lives, which is surrender ourselves completely to you. This is not a work that we can do on our own, dear Father, and so we ask that you would please help us, lead us step by step, show us how to do it, dear Father, and uh, help us to search for the instructions on how to do it. It's more than likely or positively found in your word. And so, dear Father, I pray for each and every one of us as well. Those of us that have joined and those that are uh, going to watch this at a later, later time. Father, please be with each and every one of them. Bless them and uh, bless us as well as we continue to go through the book of Revelation. These truths have been revealed. They're not a secret. They're not a mystery. They're, they're actually very plain. Uh, it's a revelation not something mysterious or um, not anything hidden. It's actually very, very clear for anyone that wishes to know. And so we thank you for that, dear Father, and we ask that you please help us with all of our trials. I do have a brother I have in mind right now. I pray for him and his family. Please be with him. Help him, Father. Give him strength. Give him courage to continue in his uh, his trial. And um, anyone else that is in needing prayers at this time, I pray for them, Father. Thank you for hearing us and thank you for the time, dear Father. These things we do ask in the precious name of your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.